Hi, this is Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Welcome to the weekly top three, the top three things on our mind here at Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets for the week of October 24th, 2022. The weekly top three is a regular segment on The Michael Duke Show. The show broadcasts on both Facebook Live and YouTube Live, as well as via streaming audio from the show's website, weekdays from 6 to 8 a.m. I join Michael weekly in the first hour of Tuesday's show from 6.25 to 7 a.m. for a discussion between the two of us about our three issues. We post the podcast of our discussion following the show on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets Facebook, YouTube, SoundCloud, Spotify, and Substack pages, also on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets website, as well as the projects page on national blog site, medium.com. You can find past episodes of the weekly top three also at the same locations. Keep in mind that in addition to these podcasts, during the week, you also can follow and participate in the discussion with us of these and other issues affecting Alaska's fiscal and economic condition by following us on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets Facebook page and through our posts on Twitter. This week, our top three issues are these. First, now that some openly are running on a, quote, bipartisan coalition, close quote, ticket, we ask, what does that mean? What's the platform? Second, supporting increases in the BSA has moved to the center of many campaigns. We examine what the discussion would look like if it had to be funded through a tax increase. And third, we explain why the phrase, don't tax me to pay for a PFD, is wrong factually, unbelievably elitist, and in the end, is just enabling continued spending. Now, Let's join Michael. Welcome to the program today. It is Tuesday, which you know, if you're a listener to the show, means that it is the Tuesday Top 3. The Weekly Top 3 with Brad Keithley from Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. He's going to be joining us here in just a little bit, and we're going to be diving down into it and talking about uh, all the big... The big things, the things, and the stuff and the things, including, <clears throat> excuse me, including the new bipartisan coalition campaigns that they're talking about, the tickets that are bipartisan. And I mean, it, and for those of you who have no idea what I'm talking about, well, there's uh, there's something that's trending here. There's something that's trending. Uh, let me uh, let me show you what's trending. Uh, recently there is, uh, there has been a, uh, a whole lot of, uh, a whole lot of stuff going on from various candidates. And the latest one is, uh, this meet and greet, uh, that is going on tonight out in Girdwood. Uh, now normally a meet and greet, no big deal, right? Except for this one features, Two candidates that are <clears throat> supposedly on different teams. It's a Girdwood meet and greet with Matt Clayman, who's running against Mia Costello, uh, uh, Matt Clayman, a Democrat, and Kathy Geisel, who's running for re-election against Roger Holland. And they've teamed up. They're doing a, a team up on the, <laughs> working together for a better, more prosperous Alaska. That is the tag at the beginning, at the bottom of their uh, little card here. But no, this is part of that whole movement for a bipartisan coalition ticket. We all need to work together to screw the people of the, I mean, to uh, take care of the people of the state of Alaska. So Brad's going to have some things to say about this. I think you already know what I think of, of this kind of stuff. Uh, Kathy Geisel, of course, has already been soundly defeated by uh, uh, Roger Holland once. The question is, can it happen again now with ranked choice voting? I think that's going to be the big question. And I think you can see here that Kathy Geisel is doing exactly the same thing that Lisa Murkowski is doing with her endorsement of Mary Peltola. Uh, She is reaching into the middle and the Democratic ranks trying to garner some votes in that regard. Um, I mean, if I was a member of her district, I would be thinking uh, in the Republican Party, I would be thinking seriously uh, about some censure action on this deal right here. 
um, you know, we're, we're all supposed to be ranking the red, right, Kathy? Right, Kathy? R- right? Uh, instead, no, 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 that's, that's not what we're doing. Instead, we are, of course, playing with the quote-unquote, I guess, enemy. We're playing with the opposition, and, uh, and we're on their team. Uh, so this is, I'm sure, something that Brad's going to be dealing with and diving into in his discussion of uh, in his discussion of the bipartisan coalition tickets that we're seeing around the state. Brad, so you you really picked some good ones today. There's some there's some good things out there, and of course this uh, this bipartisan coalition ticket thing. And it's ironic that you sent me that, and then five minutes later, somebody else dropped me the picture of that uh, meet and greet uh, flyer that was going out, and I just started shaking my head, going, "Yep, there it is, right there." Why do you, why do the labels even matter anymore, Brad? Why does it matter if we say we're a, a Democrat or a Republican? Or I think we should just take all those labels away, and it should be we're more pro government or we're more private sector, public citizen. I I I think that. Because otherwise, it just doesn't matter anymore, right? Let's hit us with number one. Well, that's one of the splits, pro-government um, uh, as opposed to private sector. Uh, the other splits, the PFD. I mean, basically what's going on, and you can see this as you as you watch different people, you know, get ready for the for the final segment of their campaign. Basically, what's going on is we have people who are running for the bi- on the bipartisan coalition ticket. I mean, they're saying that explicitly, that they're running to be part of the bi coalition bipartisan coalition. Vote for me. I'll be part of the bipartisan coalition. I'll get along with everybody. We'll go down to Juneau. We'll have a great time. We'll pass all this stuff. We'll fund schools. We'll we'll restore case, uh, university funding. We'll uh, do this and we'll do that. And and that it ha- has become a ticket. And it's become a ticket both on the left and, and on the right. Giesel is a great example of that in, uh, in the meet and greet that you were talking about during the break. Uh, with, um, uh, and since you were talking about it during the break, you may want to mention it again here, but Giesel is a great example of that by joining in a meet and greet with Matt Clayman. Uh, Giesel used to, you know, talk the Republican talk. She used to talk about uh, uh, lower government spending, reduced government spending. It wasn't just that, Brad. Remember, she had that ad where she had the wallet on the table, and this is your wallet. And Governor Walker stole money out of your wallet with the PF. I mean, she was like an ardent PFD, full PFD supporter, and then all of a sudden, <clears throat> it was all gone. And now she's, oh, I like that PFD. It's mine. <laughs> I like the PFD for government. Yeah, and and you know, and you can see where this is going. You can see the discussion at the meet and greet is going to be. We come from different sides, you know but we're going to meet in the middle. We're going to fund schools because that's what we need. That's what this state needs. We're going to restore uh, uh, university funding because that what's the, that's what this state needs. We're going to find ways to government to expand the private sector because that's what, uh, that's what this state needs. Um, and to do that, Matt Clayman has already been explicit about, about this. And, and Diesel, you know, by implication is, is, is there as well to do all this, the PFD is a lower priority. So, We'll fund the the best PFD we can, but it's going to be the leftover PFD. After we've done all this other great stuff that government needs to do for you, uh, the decisions we make about how to use your money, after government does all this stuff for you, then we'll we'll fund whatever is left over um, in a PFD. And so it's it's really they're coming together. The bipartisan coalition means two things. One's it, one, it means more government spending without a whole lot of oversight, frankly. I mean, if you got Matt Clayman on board, if you got Matt Clayman talk and, and Kathy Giesel on the same side, you're not going to have a whole lot of oversight. It's going to be increase the BSA. How much do you want to increase the BSA? Um, uh, deferred uh, uh, defined compensation plan. How much? How, how big a defined compensation plan do you want? How many people do you want to cover? You want to cover the troopers? You want to cover teachers? Anybody else? Um, it's it's going to be it, it, how much do you want to increase funding to the university? It's going to be it's going to be increase funding, and it's going to come at the expense of the PFD. They view the PFD just like Kathy Giesel, when she was in office last time, um, viewed the savings accounts, the CBR and the SBR. That's ah, money. You know, we'll just, we'll fund what we need to fund. We'll just draw down the SBR and the CBR. Well, the PFD to them has become the new savings accounts, become the new CBR right. and, F- and SBR. And we know what happened to those savings accounts, right? Right. They're gone. 
No, so, this, is, this is the match made in hell. I mean, this really is the the perfect storm of the worst thing that you could possibly pull together in two separate groups. So it's 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 the the no tax republic. Basically, the deal is this: Democrats, you le- you you take the lead on spending. You spend whatever you want to spend it on, as long as you don't tax us, the top twenty percent, right? As long as you don't tax us, you can't. We'll we'll be in a in a coalition with you in a bipartisan coalition with you, and you can spend uh, whatever it is you th- you think you need, as long as you don't tax us. As long as you don't tax us, you don't tax the oil companies, by the way. Neither one of those. That's the that's the Kelly Merrick line. So it, it is, I mean, we can see this coming. A vote for the bipartisan coalition is very clear. It's a vote for increased spending, and it's a vote for increased PFD cuts, because they're going to use the PFD to, to fund all the increased spending. And, and, and they don't even hide it much. I mean, right. it's, Oh, not anymore. It's out in the open. They're saying the quiet part out loud. I mean, this is it right here. So, you know, the, 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 the appeal is to the, I don't know, how do I, how do I phrase this? Well, the guilt ridden Democrats who feel that they ought to increase spending, um, and, and buy into the, it's free money. So I don't, I'm not entitled to a PFD, those middle and lower income Alaska families. I, I don't know about them, but, but I know I'm not entitled to this free money. And, um, and so got, we, we need to increase build spending. It's for the children. It's for whoever it's for the teachers. It's for the policemen. It's for, uh, everybody else to increase defined benefit, con- uh, comp- or not defined benefits plans. And, uh, as long as I don't have to pay for it, as long as we can take it out of the pockets of middle and, and lower income Alaska families, that's fine. So we we got a deal here. We we got a deal, and and that'll keep us in power, keep you in power, keep everybody happy. Um, in, on on our side of the line, on the top twenty percent side of the line, the government spending side of the line, keep everybody happy, uh, and uh, and we'll go forward with that. What I mean, what 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 really amazes me, Michael? I mean, this will tell you how bad a candidate Bill Walker is. Okay. If if this is if this is the the state of Alaska, if this sentiment is the state of Alaska, how the hell does Dunleavy win the governorship? So yeah. so uh, it's got to be because Bill Walker is a horrible candidate. I mean, Bill Walker would be the one who would who would you know fall right in line with the Mary Peltola, the the Lisa Murkowski, and the and 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 that ilk, the Kathy Geisels and the Matt Clemens, right. Um, he must he must be a horrible candidate if uh if 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 Dunleavy if this if this is the sentiment of Alaska if this is what we see in the election and Dunleavy still wins um I, I, Bill Walker's just a horrible candidate right well which I think we can all agree on quite honestly but you know what we're looking at here Brad I think is is really if we wanted to boil this down to to one thing it's a philosophy right we are boiling it down to candidates who truly believe in their heart of hearts that they know better than anybody else how the state's money should be spent. They don't trust the private sector. They don't trust the public, you know, the regular citizen, that they know exactly that their vision for where the state should go is is the one, right? I mean, that's really kind of what you're looking at with this. I mean, in my mind, as you look at this, especially with candidates who are coalitioning up and saying, mm, we, we, we've got a better plan than you do. And uh, yeah, go ahead. It's a combination of that, Michael. And also as long as somebody else pays for it. I mean, Matt Clayman is the, is the classic limousine liberal, right? He, he is, I'm all for Alaska families. I'm all for the Alaska economy, the working man, the, the working Alaska families. I'm all, I'm, I'm going to protect them. I'm going to do whatever it takes to protect them except <laughs> I'm going to take their money to do it right. as long as long as I don't have to pay for it. As long as I, Matt Clayman, who has on his APOC report, 350000 to $400,000 of income, as long as I don't have to pay for it, uh, uh, then, then yes, I'm going to, I'm going to do all this. I, we're going to talk in the second segment. I think the debate is entirely different if, if we were talking about taxes having to, having to pay for the spending. I think, I think debate goes off in an entirely different direction. So it's a combination of, I know better how to spend your money, not mine. I know better how to spend your money uh, than you do on these, on these government programs. And I'll support it as long as I don't, in the top 20%, the others, as long as I don't have to pay for it. Right. Exactly. I'm just going to drop this on Brad because so much wrong with this. 
Thank you, Brad, for using the term free money. We are entitled to free money as well as free government services as long as it all fits into a balanced budget. Alaska should be only uh, Alaska money should only be used for us in Alaska. It should not be shipped off to other needy countries or other states. I don't know what that whole last sentence means uh, because, wow. But Brad was not using the term for he was using it not only anecdotally but sarcastically because it's not free money, Randy. Brad, I'll let you uh, I'll let you try and attempt to beat your head against that wall for a second here. <laughs> I mean, I love Randy to death. I mean, the guy, I mean, he he pays money, but he bought a booth space at the big thing in Fairbanks and half handed out his ideas on the, but I mean, you, when you're wrong, you're wrong. So wrong. But uh, Brad, I'll let you address that. Well, it's an inheritance, right? I mean, it's, Natasha has her inheritance from her parents. All Alaska families have an inheritance from the state's, the state's commonwealth. Uh, and, and it's coming in the form of the PFD. If you leave the state, you don't get it. If you stay in the state, uh, you, you're part of the class that uh, you're part of the inheriting inheriting uh, group, um, and government uh, is taking and 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 Hammond set it up that half of that inheritance went to uh, Alaska citizens directly, half of it went to pay for government, which Hammond himself recognized essentially was a subsidy to the top twenty percent because they weren't going to have to pay taxes. We were going to you know re repeal or suspend the income tax, and so they weren't going to have to pay taxes anymore. And so half of it was going to go go to their benefit. Now what's happened is is as the top twenty percent has used up their half to to, to fund government, they 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 panicked. They've looked around and said, ah, "What what else is out there?" And 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 they've they've looked at the inheritance that Hammond set up for the other fifty for the fifty percent of that should go to Alaska citizens and decided to tax it, decided to divert it uh, to government. So I. Yeah. <laughs> Randy, Randy spends a lot of time on this, uh, but it's but but it, you can't you can't disassociate yourself from the fact that the top twenty percent, the state, have already got their fifty percent. It went to government. It right. allowed it allowed for the suspension, the repeal, the termination of the income tax. They got their benefit. Now the question, and the other half goes to the remaining, it essentially largely impacts the remaining 80%, middle and lower income Alaska families. Right. Now that the top 20% have used up their share, now they're going to take more of a, a, their share of the free money. I mean, if you want to look at it as free money, it's all free. The part that goes the, to, to, to subsidize the top 20% so they don't have to pay taxes, the part that goes to middle and lower, uh, middle and lower income Alaska families, it's all free. And right. now, that they, now that the top 20% have used up their share of the free money, they want to come get uh, uh, increasing larger pieces of the of the of the other eighty percent share. Well, and it always comes back to we are entitled to free money as well as free government services as long as it all fits in a balance. Randy's all for paying a full PFD if we balance the budget, but that's like giving a crack addict more crack and saying when you stop, it'll all be. F I mean, that's the thing. They're never going to balance the budget as long as they have that pot of money that they can dip into. They're never going to have to face the music of you only have a finite amount of money. You're never going to do that. It's got to be taken off the table. That whole argument of we have access to the PFD has got to be taken off the table. Yeah, it's the the the, the top twenty percent have free money. Also, what Randy what Randy is missing is the piece where the part that goes the half that goes to government benefits the top twenty percent. Go back in time when we when we instituted the PFD, we had an income tax. The top 20%, and it was a horrible, it was a, it was a hugely progressive income tax. Marginal rates were high. Uh, it was only on taxable income, so it really tilted against the top 20%. The, 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 the agreement on the PFD allowed the replacement of the, the suspension, replacement, repeal of that income tax. It benefited the top 20% by taking the 50% and going to government. Now... They want to take that. They want to say, oh, yeah, well, we got the benefit of that. Now we need some more benefit because we want to spend some more on government, um, but we don't want to pay for it. So let's just take let's just take the other the other 50 percent share as well. Right. Right. No, it's uh, it's frustrating. This whole thing is I mean, again, it's a repetitive argument, but uh uh, I, I just, I think, I think it's, I think it's interesting when you break it down that way, the whole idea that somehow this is a benefit. I, your inheritance idea is good, but I like to use the term shareholders. If we're shareholders in the state's wealth, which again, I didn't write the constitution. 
the framers were actually they were actually toehold by the federal government who said you won't you will you will not give the mineral rights to people i mean this is what we have this is the way it is and we've got to learn to live with it um unfortunately uh we got 20 seconds brad uh, the reason I backed away from the from the shareholder argument is because Natasha turns that into, well, board of directors set the dividend to shareholders and all we're doing is setting the dividend to shareholders. So I want to I want to build a picture that is a direct feed of, of permanent fund earnings right down to citizens. True. And that to me is that to me, the inheritance. Maybe uh, the money market account makes more sense. Right. I don't know. We'll we'll, we'll find something. Um, all right. Well, uh, I think we probably milk that one as much as we can. So we might as well move over to number two and talk about uh, and uh, talk about the second of the of the big two. And that, of course, is the continuing battle cry of the BSA. It's all about that base student allocation uh, because it's just not enough, Brad. We just haven't spent enough on it. That's the problem. This failing student scores and all this stuff, it's because we haven't spent, I mean, we spend more than almost any other state in the nation, but we still haven't spent enough. That's why we're on the bottom of the heap. Yeah. And, and Michael, it's, it's, I mean, if you look at, um, I mean, I read a range of papers. I read the, the Kenai Peninsula papers. I read the Anchorage papers, the Fairbanks papers, the Juno papers, the Ketchikan papers, the Nome papers. Um, it's fairly broad based, uh, the, the push for uh, increased BSA, the push for increased K through 12 spending. And we're going to see, I mean, we've talked about this on previous programs, but once that ball starts to roll down the hill, we're going to see defined benefit plans, you know, t- uh, 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 various uh, programs designed to increase, increase, as people will argue, increase teacher uh, uh, retention and increase uh, teachers wanting to come to Alaska. We're going to see a, a lot of stuff added on once the BSA ball starts uh, starts rolling down the hill. I saw an article from Anchorage that talks about the need to increase the geograph or re- readdress the geographical differences because Anchorage thinks it's due more uh, due to the ge- geographical differences uh, in costs. Um, so we're going to we're going to see a lot of this going on, and and we're seeing it fairly broad broad based. Here's the question that that I think. I'm thinking about, and I think others would, would benefit from thinking about as well. Would this debate be different if we were talking about fund, having to fund these sorts of increased spending through broad-based taxes and, and through, through taxes that everybody paid as opposed to PFD taxes, head taxes, that only middle and lower income Alaska families have to pay? And I think the answer to that is yes. I think the debate would be different. I don't think you would see Giesel partnering up with Matt Clayman, or I think you'd see her killed for it, uh, partnering up with Matt Clayman, uh, talking about the need to increase school funding and the need to, to do this and that, if she had to use the word taxes uh, uh, in, in talking about how she was going to pay for that. So what I think is going on, what I, what I think the K through, when you think about it that way, what I think is going on in the K through 12 debate, what we're seeing is the impact of the top 20% being able to push the cost down to middle and lower income Alaska families and, and middle and lower Alaska families who are working families, who've got other things to do, just sort of taking it on the chin um, and letting the top 20% get away with it. If we, I think this debate would be much, much, much different and much sharper if we, uh, if we were including, uh, if, if we were talking about uh, if Kathy Diesel had to talk about, well, it's going to be taxes that uh, that we're going to have to levy in order to, uh, to increase spending. Because absent the PFD cuts, absent the P- that's exactly what we'd have to be talking about. Absent, yeah. absent taking money out of the pockets of middle and lower income Alaska families, that's exactly what we would have to be talking about for, for these additional spending programs. Right. If the PFD debate was off the table, they would have to face the facts that we're spending more than we take in, period. End of and, story. And, and to fund it, you would have to... Uh, you would have to, to uh, uh, raise taxes. So I think, you know, I, I know that that probably in the chat room, people are going ballistic, but that the Keith Lee's in support of taxes. I'm not, but I'm in support of all Alaska families having to face up to the fact that we have to pay for this government. Right. What we're doing now through, through using PFD cuts is we're shoving the cost of middle and lower income Alaska families. They're not, they're, they're the ones having to take the burden. We're already 20% 
is essentially, I mean, what, what the message has been on this program with you for the last, you know, umpteen years has been, we're already being taxed. We're already shouldering that burden. And unfortunately, it's disproportionately affecting the lowest 80 percentile of the income brackets in the state. That's been the message. Not that we're in support of taxes, but there should be a true reckoning of what the cost of state government is, period, full stop. And if we had that, if we had if we had to talk about taxes, if we had to talk about broad-based taxes, all Alaska families contributing to the costs of government, all Alaska families being dinged to pay the increase to the to pay for the increase of the BSA, to pay for the defined benefit compensation for the teachers. If if we if we had that, and that kind and that was the conversation we had, we were gonna have, I think. I, I don't think we'd see Giesel, you know, partnering up with Matt Clayman. I think we would see the clear distinction that you and I, you know, want to see between those who support the private sector and those who support the government. It's just that it's just that the top 20 percent over the last six years, seven years has been able to turn the PFD, the discussion about the PFD into, oh, it's just another savings account. And yeah, we're draining. Right. Down, but, but who cares? Um, it, they've been able to turn the discussion into that as opposed to it's a tax and you're taking money from middle and lower income Alaska, Alaska families. You're withholding and diverting to government money from middle and lower in, in Alaska families and you're letting the top 20 percent off the hook. And don't forget, they're also taxing the children, says Chris in the chat room. Absolutely. The children are facing that same disproportionate tax as well. We're finishing up. We've got just going to finish up with number two, uh, which is uh, discussions on the uh, which is discussions on the PFD and the BSA and everything else. Let me just tell you, Brad, before you finalize your thoughts on number two, what I find most irritating and most disingenuous is that every article that I've read so far talking about how we're underfunding education and we're not, we haven't seen an increase to the BSA and the school children, are, they're dying in the streets and all the other stuff that we're seeing is that none of them, they, they talk about, the the P, the BSA like it's in exclusion like it's the only thing we're spending. Nobody is talking about total spend on education. The BSA is just a tiny part. It's the beginning of it, and everything else is on top of it. They've acted like that's all we've spent on education for years. Not talking about the billions and billions <laughs> of dollars that have been spent on other parts of the program, and I find that to be so disingenuous. It just it just roils my blood. But I'll let you finish up here. Well, let, let me say two things. One, I think you're right, Michael. But but what the point I'm trying the point I'm making is that we've got to broaden this conversation beyond just the other eighty percent when we're talking about people get upset about about spending. They get upset about it, but the top twenty percent don't. And we've got to find a way to include the top 20, to make the top 20% part of that conversation until they have an incentive, until they feel a pain from uh, from this increased spending. Um, I, you and I can talk ourselves blue in the face. David Boyle can write great articles. Uh, uh, other people can, can spend a lot of time focused on education, but you've got to get the top 20% in that conversation. Uh, and until they are, until they're pushing back, until they're telling their representatives, hey, I'm not going to donate to you because you're just wanting to increase my tax burden. Um, until we have until we have those conversations, it's just going to be a nice conversation between ourselves. The other thing I want to say is this is this isn't my this 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 concept that we have to broaden the the base of those who are paying. Um it's not it's not not my concept it is governor hammond's concept hammond hammond if you go back and read diapering the devil as i do seemingly almost weekly now if you go back and read diapering the devil there's a great passage in there where he talks about the sword of damocles and and what he envisioned for an income tax was not to use it but to have it hanging like a sword of damocles over the legislators if they overspent and 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 the concept was if you if you overspend, you're going to have to tax. If you tax, uh, then you're going to get the top 20 percent that, that are going to come down on you like a top of like a like a uh, ton of bricks. And you won't like that. So you'll never tax because this sort of Damocles, this contingent tax will always be sort of hanging over you. And I think I think Hammond was absolutely right on that point. I think right. I think the concept of having to pay the tax if the additional spending occurs is enough to dissuade the additional spending occurring if 
the tax is broad based and the top 20 percent, including and other Alaska families have to have to pay it as this long year. as as long as that sort of Damocles is only on the top 80 on the bottom 80 percent. Legislatures they demonstrated don't they don't care. Yeah, they don't care. I mean, this is why Hammond was so adamantly against absolutely repealing the tax. He had argued that it should go to zero and stay on the books up until the point that, like you said, they you can go this far and no farther. If you take a step over that line, it triggers the tax, uh, the the uh, the income tax again, and then you're going to have to answer some very uncomfortable questions. Uh, and unfortunately, here's where we're at. Not not only not only would uh, Kathy Geese will be talking differently. Matt Clayman would be talking differently. I mean, Scott Kawasaki, I, 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 I think highly of Scott for, for several reasons, but Scott Kawasaki's got it. I mean, Scott, Scott is trying to articulate that, that if we continue to spend, if we continue to push the envelope, we're going to have, we're going to have PFD cuts, conservative Democrat. You'd have Matt Clayman making that same argument. If, uh, right. uh, if, uh, if, 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 if that, if the sort of Damocles, the income tax sort of Damocles was hanging over the legislature's head. All right. Well, let's talk about your pet peeve and really kind of one of my pet peeves as well is, uh, you know, hearing this phrase, well, I don't want to be taxed to pay for the PFD. That's number three. Uh, you know, you're going to be taxed if you're going to pay for the PFD. We're already being taxed. I mean, that's, that's the whole argument right there is you're already being taxed. The PFD is a tax and it is a, a regressive on the lowest 80%. But this this phrase has been coming up more and more when it first popped up and we saw a lot of Republicans using it. I lost my mind. You were upset about it. But it's still just this whole thing continues. Give me number three. Well, last week's show when uh, when you quoted Don Linton Warren as uh, as as ca causing that, I, it took me like three hours to calm down after after our uh, after our <laughs> segment segment was over. It, it's factually incorrect. Right. It's the PFD, the, the a tax would not go to PFD. The PFD is coming from the permanent fund earnings. It's an inheritance. Would describe it however you want. But to me, it's an inheritance coming down from the permanent fund earnings to benefit all Alaska families. The, it, it, the, there's nothing, I mean, the PF, the permanent fund earnings aren't running short uh, of paying the PFD. They've, they've got more than enough funds in there to pay the PFD. We don't need a tax to pay the PFD. The money's there sitting in the in the permanent fund earnings account and continues to be replenished in a way that would be that that provides enough to uh, to pay the, the PFD. So the concept, the concept, first of all, is factually inaccurate. Second, it's what's leading to increased spending. I mean, the top 20 percent are blowing off PFD cuts by saying, yeah, I don't have to you know, they're not going to affect me as long as I don't have to pay a tax. I don't really care about them. And, and so that phrase, don't tax me to pay the PFD, is misdirecting the anger. It's, it's directing the top 20, it's allowing the top 20% to direct their anger at the PFD, as opposed to directing the anger at, as it should be, at increased spending. They're using it as a way to escape responsibility or to escape confronting the fact that their inaction is what's allowing additional spending uh, to occur. So it's factually inaccurate. It's elitist as hell. I mean, it's just, I, you know, I'm, I'm in the top 20%. I, PFDs don't mean that much to me, so I don't have to pay them. So just don't, just don't make me pay. Just don't make me pay, you know, for, for somebody else. That's not what's going on. Right. The money's, if you have, the, if the you money's in at, the permanent fund earnings. Right. If you look at where the monies are, the buckets of money, I mean, in that it, most people, their eyes start to glaze over, but it's important. It's important to understand funding sources and know where these things are supposed to be coming from. That's why the legislature has worked so hard over the last four years to make sure that they never draw the PFD from the earnings reserve because it would give credence to the argument that that's where it's supposed to be coming from. I mean, again, this may be a small, minute, you know, technical thing to many people, but that is an important point. When they drew the money from the earnings reserve, and that's why Bert Stedman fought so hard for it not to be last year, is because they don't want to give credence to that's the funding source of the money. The, the, the problem with this state, the problem with spending in this state is the top 20% is not pushing back. Don Litton Warren, Chris Warren, they're not pushing. They'll, they'll tell you they are. They'll tell you they talk about spending, but they don't have a personal stake in it. And they're not telling their reps, stop spending or I won't vote for you or I won't fund you. The top 20% are not pushing back on spending. That's where this problem comes from. And don't tax me to pay off PFD is sort of their 
excuse. They're, they're sort of playing it like their get out of jail card. Like, well, it's not my fault. I mean, it's 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 the PFD's fault. And and we ought to take it out on the PFD. You ought to cut the PFD to, to fund all this government. Well, it is their fault because they're not pushing back on spending. And until Hammond had it right, until there's an incentive for the top 20% to get in the game, for them to, to, to push back on their representatives, to push back on their senators, to push back on their governor. Uh, for for increased spending until they get in the game to do that, we're going to continue. You and I are going to continue to talk ourselves blue in the face about about the problems with spending. It's exactly the thing, and this is what happens when people miss. Uh, I guess they change the narrative. They change the conversation. Uh, you know, they they put this false argument out there of well, you know, taxes or PFDs. It's a false dichotomy choice, and unfortunately. Most people don't either understand the details or take the time to learn the details uh, to be able to counteract that argument, right? Well, Michael, it, it, it's a combination of that. And yes, we do have working Alaska families that you know don't, don't spend their entire waking hours working on or thinking about fiscal policy. It's a combination of that. But it's also a combination of what are the top 20% working hardest on? They're not working hardest on decreasing spending. They're working hardest on pushing the burden over to middle and lower income Alaska families by using PFD cuts. That's where their energy is going. They don't give a flip about spending because it doesn't affect them. Right. Except in a, in a positive way, as in, you know, if they're a, contra- a government contractor, it doesn't affect them. They don't give a flip about it. What they care about most is making sure that middle and lower income Alaska families are the ones that, that carry the burden. So the, the, the class that is the donor class, the class that, you know, writes the op-eds, the class that, you know, gives to the candidates, the class that the, the, the candidates talk to the most because, they, because those are, that's the class that gives the most, that class is not pushing back on spending. That class is pushing back on middle and lower income Alaska families through, through crap sayings like, don't tax me. For a PFD, I mean, it's just crap. It, 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 it's it's diversionary. It's an effort to divert the the responsibility and the blame and the and the burden of what's going on with government away from themselves over to middle and lower income Alaska families. And I and you know I don't blame middle and lower Alaska middle and lower income Alaska families for not pushing back harder. I mean, they've got lives they've got to live. They you know they're sort of used to taking whatever uh, rolls downhill. Uh, from uh, from the upper uh, from the from the top twenty percent, what I blame is is our representatives and our government for not broadening the burden to include the top twenty percent, letting them off the hook, not having this sort of Damocles hanging over their head, so they look at spending. Right. I, that that's 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 where the blame lies. Not engaging the top twenty percent in the effort of trying to push back on spending. As I've said again and again and again, uh, until the PFD issue is resolved, we will the legislature and and the elected leaders will never have to face the music of 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 income versus revenue Uh, until that pot of money is sealed away and taken out of their hands. They will never have to face the music. And that's that's the thing that only then will real solutions start to come forward until then. It's just. Hey, it's a free piggy bank. We can crack it open anytime we want. Because then the sort of Damocles will come into play. Then if the PFD is taken off the table, if we recognize that it is an inheritance, if it's not, that it's not a government revenue stream, once then it's taken off the table, then you have the sort of Damocles. Want to increase spending? Well, you're going to have to get the money from somewhere. And the only place left now is taxes. And oh my gosh, all of a sudden, you know, Kathy Giesel, well, I'm against that. And, and, you know, and, and all the other, representatives and, and bipartisan coalition uh, uh, wannabes out there will go, well, I'm against that. I'm against taxes. Um, and, and so once we change the debate, until we change the debate, I mean, maybe we never change it. Maybe, maybe this is a lost cause. But until we change that debate so that the top 20%, Hammond had this exactly right, until we change that debate so the top 20% are sitting there with the sort of Damocles of taxes sitting on their head, sitting over their head until we change that debate. We're, we're not going to, we're not going to make progress. You and I and the other 80% can talk about it all day long, but we're just not going to make progress. 
Brad Keithley, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Thank you, my friend. I'm glad. I, I was it cathartic? Was it cathartic? Do you feel better? I mean, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, I won't. I won't be slamming stuff around for the next three hours like I was okay, after good, last week. Good. Well, yeah. Last week is a bit. I could see blood shooting out of your eyes, so it's all good. <laughs> uh, all right, Brad. Thank you so much for coming on board, my friends. Good to see you, Michael. As always, thanks for having me. Well, that's a wrap for another week's edition of the weekly top three from Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Thank you again for joining us. Remember that you can find past episodes on our YouTube, SoundCloud, Spotify, and Substack pages. And keep track of us during the week on Facebook and Twitter. This has been Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. We look forward to you joining us again next week on the Weekly Top 3.